Welcome everyone to the eMedica GP Training 2023 Next Steps webinar. Let me introduce myself for those that haven't met me before. My name is Muhibur Rahman. I'm a portfolio GP based here in Birmingham and Solihull. And myself and the team here at eMedica, we've been supporting GP trainees now for over 17 years. And we've trained over 62,000 delegates now. We're going to talk about these things. So we'll talk a little bit about the basics of offers because some of you have only just got your offer a couple of days ago. Some of you might actually be here you haven't got an offer yet, but you're anticipating or hoping to get one from the waiting list. A lot of you are going to start being contacted about picking your rotations over the next week or so. Some people are contacted today. Some will be contacted tomorrow. Some will be contacted next week. OK, so we're going to look at which rotations might be helpful. How do you interpret the information they send you, how to pick rotations and how they allocate them? Then I'm going to touch on key things that you need to do before you start training. So some of the paperwork and some of the forms that you're going to need to fill in before you start training. Then what happens when you get into training? I'm going to give you a very brief overview of the structure of GP training and of the three parts of MRCGP because of the length of time of this session. We're just going to cover an overview. But what I will tell you about is at the end how the GPST Plus course on how to maximize your GP training will help you hit the ground running and have a really clear plan for what are all the things I need to do to succeed in year one of training, year two of training, year three of training, and things that I can do during training that will help me be competitive and succeed after training. That's a full day course where we can cover these things in a lot more detail. And then at the end, after all of this, is when we're going to cover the Q&A. Okay, so that's the program. Let's begin. Offer basics. So what's happened is once you've accepted an offer, the information about who has accepted an offer in which area? Because remember now, there are no upgrades possible. Wherever you've accepted an offer, that's where you're going to be training. You can't swap that with anyone else. There's no chance of getting any upgrades. Okay, Those of you that might get offers from the waiting list later on, you can either accept, and that's where you're training, or you can reject and apply in a future year. You won't have any chance to upgrade. You can't hold. You won't have any chance to swap. Okay, So those who have accepted an offer, you know where you're going to go now. So that information as to who's going to be going to which deanery, that's been passed to the relevant lead employer. Now, each deanery at this point has their own process. And that's why some of you might have friends who've already been contacted about rotations. And some of you, you've had zero contact, even though you accepted an offer a month ago, right at the beginning of March. OK, um, and that's because each team has got its own timeline. Some are slower, some are bigger. Some have got hundreds of doctors to deal with. Some have got 120 doctors to deal with, much smaller deaneries, okay? So each deanery will now run their own process. So you might not be contacted for a few weeks. Don't panic, if that's the case, okay? But when you do get contacted, read the information provided in the email carefully. And for any queries that are specific to your deanery, contact the deanery. They'll usually say reply to this email or they'll give you contact details of who to contact for specific queries okay and often i'll get contacted ask you know what should i do in this case my deanery the answer is you need to contact them because it's different in each deanery okay the other thing you can do is you can ask in the gp training support group because there might be someone in the same deanery who can answer that because they've already raised that query or they've already you know a day ahead of you in the process for example okay but if you read the information carefully, normally they tell you what to do and when. Okay, so let's talk about the next step once they actually contact you and they start. So, for example, they're going to start getting your references. You're going to be asked to fill in various forms, loads of forms. So things like occupational health, things like that. Okay, But one of the things they're going to contact you about probably in the next couple of weeks is about rotations. Okay, now let's start with a question. What do you think? is the most important non-GP rotation to do as part of GP training. Most of you will have two years in GP and one year in hospital. Some of you, because there's still some deaneries that have 18 months in hospital and 18 months in, in GP, might have a year and a half in hospital. But the reality is most people won't get all the rotations that they want. Some people won't get any of the rotations they want. Some people might get one that they wanted and one or two that they didn't want. Some of you will only have two hospital rotations because if you're only doing a year and you have six month rotations in your deanery rather than four month rotations, you might only do two hospital jobs and the rest is GP, right? Okay. So if you could just pick one, I'll launch a poll. Out of these, and you know, if it's anything else not on the list, pick J. Okay. 
But what do you think is the most important non-GP rotation? I'll launch a poll. I'll give you a few seconds to look at this, and then I'll launch a poll. Okay, so just have a think about it first for about 50 seconds, then I'll launch a poll. Okay, so what you can see is that actually most of you, nearly half of you, if you could only pick one, you've picked a &E. And then after that, peds is the second most popular one, followed by medicine. And then it's an even split between OBS and gynae and psychiatry, then care of the elderly. And then the others, far fewer as a percentage, pick the other options here. Okay, so now in terms of what is the actual answer, what is the most important non-GP rotation? The answer is that there isn't a single rotation that's the most important. Any one of these rotations could be useful to you if you go in with the mindset and pick what's helpful in your future career as a GP from it. But also what's going to be most beneficial to you will depend on your own past experience. For example, some of you, you might have already done two or three years of pediatrics before you're coming to GP. If you didn't do any pediatrics during your GP training rotation as a hospital rotation, it probably wouldn't matter. You've already got far more experience than you're going to get from four months or six months at a junior level during GP training in hospital. Do you see? So for that person, and that person might not have done any care of the elderly since medical school. That might be much more valuable to them. Someone else has been working in general medical wards where as part of that, you're also going to see a lot of older patients and do some of the things that cross over with care of the elderly. If you didn't get medicine or care of the elderly, that probably wouldn't matter. But you might not have done obstetrics and gynecology for a long time. You might not have done any ENT or eyes or dermatology for a long time. That might be much more valuable to you. You see, you're going to see all of these areas. Okay, in A and E, what you see is anything, right? So that's similar to GP. A lot of things that turn up to A and E actually are things that should be seen in GP. It's just that patients decided to go to A and E. They didn't want to, you know, wait for the appointment time. Or it was a time like a weekend or the middle of the night when the GP practice is closed. So they just turned up to A&E. You know, for example, probably, you know, one in four, one in five patients you're going to see in practice will either be a child or it's a mum or dad come to talk to you about their child. OK, there's going to be lots of things that are to do with women's health. You know, general medicine is broad, doesn't it? It covers the same things that you could see in a GP setting, just often where we've referred in because they've progressed in their disease. OK, because that covers things like endocrinology, cardiovascular, respiratory and, and so on. We have an aging population. So care of the elderly is very helpful. Psychiatry, the bulk of psychiatric conditions in the UK are dealt with in GP by GPs, not in hospital by consultants, because the majority of patients with depression and anxiety we deal with in GP. OK, musculoskeletal orthopedics, probably one in 10 patients that we see will have a musculoskeletal problem. You know, ENT, eyes, derm a lot of patients present about 10% of GP consultations are to do with skin, okay? And then palliative care. The fact that we have an aging population, increasingly there's more and more patients that are going to need palliation in the community, okay? And then others, you know, there's lots of other things that you might get, right? So any of you could have one of these rotations and if you go into it with the wrong mindset, for example, let's say you get allocated to orthopedics. You could go into it with, oh, I hate this. I want to be a GP. I don't want to do this. It's a waste of time. And if you go in with that mindset, you're right. You've made it a waste of time. But if you go into that and think, okay, the patients that get referred to orthopedics because they've got osteoarthritis of the hip and they need a hip operation, I'm, as a GP, going to be the one that's going to have to examine that joint and pick it up in the first place. When I do baby checks, because we don't see things in isolation, right? You know, when I see a baby at six to eight weeks and do a baby check, why am I doing Barlow's and Ortolani and looking for a clunk to see if there's a hip problem that I want to refer to orthopedics for? So you know what, let me learn how to examine these joints. I did orthopedics actually before I was a GP. And some of the skills I learned, and then some of the things that I learned after, like injecting joints, are really useful to me now, okay? ENT, eyes, dermatology, similarly, if you go in with the attitude of, I'm going to take from this, I'm going to try to get my ward, ward work done and then go and sit in clinic, learn how to examine things, learn how to use the equipment, learn what conditions come in, ask questions. You can gain benefit from any rotation you get. So don't worry too much if you don't get the things that, you know, you wanted. If you go in with the right mindset, 
you can make it worthwhile. If you're going with the wrong mindset, you could have something that would be really valuable to someone else. Like two doctors could have the same rotations in the same hospital. One finds huge value from it. The other one takes nothing from it. Okay. And you have to accept that when you're in hospital, a big part of the time that you're there, you are there doing the jobs of service provision. You've got to find the learning points yourself. A lot of times the consultants are so busy. And if you're like, you're not their trainees. I, the ENT doctors have got the people who are going to be ENT consultants in the future, the ENT registrars. That's their trainees. They'll take ownership of them. You're passing through for a few months and moving on. They know that you're in GP training. But if you ask and take an interest, they'll be happy to teach you. Okay. Whereas if you don't, you might find that you're just doing the ward work. And if you don't proactively go to ask and sit in clinic and try to learn, that they're not going to go out of the way to teach you things. Okay. So that's really important mindset. Okay. There isn't a single rotation that is the best or most important. Any of these would be beneficial. Okay. Now, in terms of ranking rotations, again, both the process and the timelines are specific to each deanery. So some of you, let me know in the chat, any of you that have already been contacted about rotations today or yesterday. And some of you will be contacted tomorrow. And as I said, a lot of you next week and the week after. So some of the things that you might see you might not understand some of the terminology. So let me go through that. You might see something labeled as a rotation that's ITP. ITB, ITP stands for either innovative training post or integrated training post, okay? Sometimes you see them called DSP, dedicated skills post, or other similar names. What these are, are programs where during that ITP post or dedicated skills post, you'll split your week where you'll do some of the week in a GP practice and some of the week in hospital. When you're in hospital, you may or may not take part in the on-call rotor. Again, it's different to each hospital and each rotation. So you just need to get that information locally. Some of you might get allocated to heft or trailblazer posts. Again, there's variation between heft posts in one area and another area. But often these are areas of high deprivation, of increased need, and they in include additional learning on top of your GP training without any additional training time. And so you'll see, they mention on the heft website, that you need to be aware that this can add extra challenge, okay? And then how you rank or preferential rotations is also different. In most cases, you'll do it via Oriel. Some deaneries, they'll just send you an email and ask you to do it locally on their website or to sort of email in an Excel sheet or something like that. One thing that is really important is make sure you rank all the rotations, okay? I'll explain why. Okay, so here's an example. Sometimes, you might see a list like this, okay? And you might think, well, I have no idea what this means. And if you just look at this, of course, it doesn't make any sense, right? What you'll need to do is, again, if you read the email carefully, usually there will be a link to an Excel sheet or a document or a place on their website where each of these will be labeled. So you can see here, EOE GP1 is this rotation. It means you're gonna do GP first, then medicine, then GP, okay? Now, medicine four and medicine five, they just don't worry about the numbers. It just means it's medicine, okay? So that they've got to have different groups of people who are going to be doing medicine, okay? Similarly, if this is like number 21, okay? So number 21 is obstetrics and gynecology, then medicine, then GP, okay? So what you need to do is decide what you want and in which order. Now, let's say someone just put two or three in their wanted, left everything else in not wanted. And if... They couldn't offer you because in most cases, this will be done on rank order based on your MSRA score, okay? If they couldn't allocate you to any of the ones that you wanted, they're gonna just randomly allocate you to the ones that you didn't want. This is different to when you're applying for GP training where you should only rank places you're happy to stay in for three years because you will never be offered a job in a place you don't want. But you're already going to this area. That's not gonna change now, do you see? So in terms of rotations, if you only rank a couple and they can't allocate one of those, they're gonna randomly allocate you any of the others. So it's much better that you just rank them all in the order of genuine preference. The other thing you need to be aware of is some deaneries will allocate some people randomly, regardless of MSRA score, okay? There's nothing you can do about that, right? So that's why if you see you know, all numbers and things and it doesn't make any sense, that's what it means. Sometimes the link to find this document will be sent to you in a separate email and like you get the notification from Oriel to rank and you haven't got the other email yet. And you think, oh, this makes no sense. Just be patient wait, it will come in due course, okay? Now, so how to rank, I want things to put near the top. 
couple of things to think about. I recommend that you pick things that you lack exposure or confidence in. And as I mentioned, you know, if you don't get the things that you'd like for the hospital part, don't worry too much because the bulk of your learning is going to be when you're in GP anyway. You're going to learn the GP relevant things for all the different conditions and, and topics that are important. Okay. The other thing to do is pick things that you're interested in. Okay. So, you know, you could do a mixture of this. Like, let's say you're going to pick three rotations. There might be something that you really love and you think, I'd like to develop an interest in that later. So you might pick that so that you try to start getting a bit more exposure. But then maybe the other two, you pick things that you haven't done for a long time and you don't feel confident in, so you get that exposure. Just be aware that nobody will ever get exposure to all the specialties that they want or need to be a great GP. And that's because to be a great GP, all the things I showed you, you need to get good at and confident in. You're going to see all of those regularly as a GP. Each clinic is going to be different. Most of you will only get two or three rotations in hospital. So you're never going to get exposure to everything. So as long as you're going with the right approach, you can take the value from that rotation and be proactive to get exposure to the specialties that are missing. So how could you do that? Well, you can start reading. You can do e-learning modules. You can do an additional diploma or certificate during your training or after to get confident. When you're in the GP part of your training, not in the hospital part of your training, but in the GP part, you get one half day. We call this a session. One half day every week for self-directed learning. This is not time off. It's not a half day off to go shopping. But this is time, for example, let's say now you didn't have any PEDS and you didn't get allocated any PEDS and you're not confident in PEDS. So you could contact one of the local consultants in the pediatric department and say, look, for the next six weeks or the next eight weeks, on a Wednesday afternoon, could I come in and sit in with you in clinic? Because I'd really like to get more exposure to pediatrics as part of my GP training. And if you are proactive and ask someone, usually they're really happy to have you. You know, they see someone that takes an interest in their specialty. Normally people really like that. Okay. But it's for you to organize it self-directed. You see, no one's going to organize it for you. So you need to organize that. And then you go to your supervisor and you say, look, I'd like to do this for the next six weeks on my self-directed learning session. Is that okay? So you get approval for it. Okay. Also, when you're seeing patients during GP posts, ask questions, things that you're not sure about, ask your trainer, ask your supervisor, read up the relevant NICE guideline. That's going to help you to sort of understand how to deal with it better next time. And then you can proactively go on courses or use your study leave for things that are going to help you get up to date and to cover things that are missing. So two that we run or are going to be running that are specifically tailored to this. One is the GP training live national GP training conference. So we run this once a year and we run GP focused workshops. I'll tell you a bit more about that. And then the other is something that's launching later this year is that we're going to be running GP update evenings where there'll be an hour of CPD covering a clinical topic, a professional topic, and then a dinner and a chance to meet other trainees and also qualified GPs. Okay. But we'll be covering different topics and we'll run them in the North, in the Midlands and in uh, the South. Okay. So that, that's another way that you could meet others and, and sort of get exposure. So the GP, Training Live, National GP Training Conference. One of the things that a lot of doctors were highlighting that they were finding it difficult to get exposure to certain specialties during training, and they wanted to find a way where they could go to a course and you know get good teaching on this. So we launched in 2019, the National GP Training Conference. Okay. All of the workshops are focused for GP because sometimes you might go to you know, a conference organized by a hospital where it's very much about what's going to happen in the hospital. These are all GP focused. We also touch on GP career. So we did Birmingham in 2019, London in 2020, 2021. It was during the lockdown in the pandemic. So we did a live stream last year. We were in Birmingham and had a live stream this year. We haven't finalized the details, but it will be at some point in the autumn or winter. So watch out for the details. But for example, we've had workshops with a consultant psychiatrist, consultant dermatologist, a GP with specialist interest in women's health. I talked about professional uh, career options and money matters, uh, consultant ophthalmologist. Last year, we had someone who was the team doctor and is still the team doctor for the England football youth team. OK, he's been to the Youth World Cup with them recently. They, they won that. OK, um, he talked about portfolio careers, but then he also did musculoskeletal medicine for GPs. We've had ENT for GPs. Uh, we've had um, women's health for GPs. We had a consultant obstetrician last year. She's been appointed a consultant now. So, you know, these are ways where it's like an hour and a half workshop covering 
some of the key things that you're going to see and need to know how to manage in GP, but for that specialty. But it's the, the whole point is that it's targeted for GP trainees. They know the level that you're at and that you're in GP. Okay, so let's talk about key things to do before training. I'll give you an overview of the structure of GP training at MRCGP, tell you how the GPST Plus course can help you, um, and then we'll take questions. So things that you need to do before training. One of the things is that you'll get an email saying that your job, if you like, has been transferred via tracks and that you need to like confirm or claim that job. Your references will be checked. You'll be asked uh, to get an enhanced DBS. That's a disclosure and barring service, a police check, basically. Now, something really important about that. Once you get that certificate, within 28 days of it being issued, please register for the update service. The update service is only £13 a year. If you don't register for the update service, what will happen is when you go from hospital to GP, you'll be asked to do a new one. Okay, and that can take some time, but there's also a cost. It can cost 40 to 70 pounds, depending on the provider, okay, depending on the DNB or the area. Similarly, if you want to do any locums, you'll need to do a new one. Whereas if you're on the update service, only 13 pounds a year, you can just give the number of the update service and they can just check it electronically and it's instant. Okay, you'll be asked to do occupational health, your immunization history, and so on. One of the other things that's really important anyone that hasn't already got ALS, ELALS from Resuscitation Council UK, EU, or Australia. Please make sure you get that done before you start. Okay. And then you'll be sent lead employer forms and something called Form R or its equivalent. In Scotland, it's some slightly different, but I'll explain that in a minute. Okay. So I just want to highlight why this bit's important. Now, you weren't asked to submit or upload an ALS certificate as part of foundation competencies. So that, what that means is a lot of people think that that means they don't need it. That's not the case at all. Look, this is one of the F2 competencies that you've had ticked off, that you demonstrate performance of advanced life support, including CPR, manual defib, and management of life-threatening arrhythmias, and is able to lead the resuscitation team where necessary. And it has a note under that. An ALS course alone is insufficient evidence. I, this is the minimum, but that on its own isn't enough. What they're saying is, you should already have shown to get this signed off competence in doing this in the real life setting. On your first week in training, you're expected to already have this competence. You could be part of the cardiac arrest team and some deaneries, some hospitals will ask if you're starting in hospital for you to produce a certificate. But it's not about the, forget about the certificate, it's beyond that. It's about competence. Imagine week one, you're on call, you're part of the cardiac arrest team, and you're the first one there and you're expected to lead it and you haven't done the course and you haven't got that confidence and you, you, you freeze and you're stuck. What can happen is, first of all, the patient can come to harm, but this is the kind of thing that can lead to them asking, well, how did you get this signed off if you actually haven't got this competence? And that could lead to significant issues. So please get this so you get that confidence and that competence, that's really important, okay? And then the lead employer forms. Now, this again causes a lot of confusion sometimes because the lead employer is not always the same place. In fact, in most cases, not where you're trading. The lead employer is someone who's going to handle your contracts and payroll. In England, St. Helens and Nosley is the lead employer for most deaneries, not all of them, though, but for most of them. Okay. So sometimes you'll get an email saying, and I've had lots of people contact me, and you might have seen in the GP training support with people saying, oh, I, I accepted a job in Leicester, but now I've got this email from St. Helens and that's up north. I don't want to go there. You're not going there. You're not going to be working there. You're going to be working where you accepted a job. They're just going to handle your contract and pay you. That's all. Okay. Some of you, your lead employer will happen to be where you're actually working as well, because in some cases they are the same, because there is a GP training scheme in St. Helens and Nosley. So those people, both their deanery and their lead employer is the same. Okay. So it could be the deanery, it could be a health board or a trust. Okay. Again, the specific forms, there's local variation. So if you're not sure, reply to their email and ask them for any queries that are specific to their forms, okay? Now, some of the other forms that they might ask you to produce before you start training, for those that are in training, they might ask you a copy of your last ARCP. For those that are in non-training posts, they might ask for a copy of your last appraisal. For those that have not worked in the NHS before, or you've been in the NHS less than 12 months, so you haven't actually had your first appraisal, then they might ask you just to fill in the form for the last 12 months, wherever that was in the world with the relevant information. They're gonna ask you to complete a training agreement outlining your duties as a trainee. And then you'll all be asked to complete form R part A 
if you're outside Scotland, or the Churas form, which is the equivalent of form R part A, if you're in Scotland. Okay. Some of you may also be asked to fill in form R part B or SOAR, which is the equivalent in Scotland now. And then form R part B, you'll fill in every year before your ARCP, before your annual review of progression. Okay. Form R part A, normally you just fill in once at the beginning. So I'll show you the key parts in form R part A and form R part B that often lead to confusion so that you know you know what you're doing. Now, in terms of filling in form R, again, there's different versions of the form in different deaneries. Some of you will fill it directly online via something called TSS, which is trainee self-service. That's used by some deaneries. Other deaneries will ask you to fill in the PDF form. In Scotland, you'll fill in the Churas form, okay, via usually an online system, but it's very similar. Okay, so let me show you form R part A and what it looks like, okay? All right, so this is what form R part A looks like. So most of this, you know how to fill in. You know, it's your name, um, your which deanery have you got your job in, your immigration status. Now here, if you don't have any at the moment, okay, just select that, you see, whatever is the relevant option for you, you can put in, okay? If none of these fit, you can put other and you can type in something manually, okay? So, you know, primary qualification, MBBS, MBCHB, MBBCH, your medical school, you know, all of this, your home address, contact you, very straightforward, right? Okay. You can, if you're using the online system, upload a photo, or otherwise you can click it and then attach and upload a photo. Now, these are the bits that cause confusion. Okay. So the first one is this. You can only take one of these six options. All of you are going to pick this option that you're appointed to a program leading to award of CCT. And that's because Although some of these options are still on the form, this is what you will all get if you're entering GP training at ST1. You'll get a CCT, okay? So that's what you're going to pick in. You don't need to worry about any of the other options, all right? Program specialty is GP. Here, specialty one for award of CCT is also GP. But here, you're not gonna get dual CCT, so leave number two blank. The Royal College is RCGP, the Royal College of General Practice. So again, you know, when you click this, it will come up with a scroll and you select Royal College of General Practitioners. Anticipated completion date is the first Tuesday of August 2026. So if you're training full time, that will be the 4th of August 2026. If you're training less than full time, it would depend how less than full time. For example, if you're training 80%, it's going to add nine months to your training. If you're training at 50%, it's going to take you six years. Okay, do you see, to complete your training. Training grade is ST1 for everyone. No one can start at ST2 or ST3. So all of you are going to select ST1 here, okay? Date started, none of you have started. What they mean is the date you're going to start. So that's going to be the 2nd of August for most of you. Some of you might have a September start time. It will be written in your offer, okay? Host type or appointment, okay? So for all of you, this is a type of run-through training, okay? GP training is run-through. What that means is that you're not going to apply again midway for higher training. From when you start and then you finish, you get CCT. So it's a run-through training. If you're training full-time, you put full-time. Otherwise, 80%, 70%, you know, whatever it is, you enter that there. And then you can digitally sign and there's instructions on how to do that. The date, okay? Do not fill anything in at the bottom. That's not for you. That's for the deanery to fill in. Similarly, this is not your GMC number. This is the program approval number. The deanery will fill this in. Your GMC number goes over here. Okay, so that's form R part A, okay? The one for those in Scotland, ask for similar information, but they're the key things that you need to fill in, okay? Form R part B, some of you will be asked to fill this in now, and then again, all of you will be asked to fill this in shortly before each ARCP, so every year during training, okay? Again, most of it's self-explanatory. Your name, your GMC, the deanery, GP practice, you know, general practice is what you're doing. But what they not ask you to do is since last ARCP or since you got GMC registration or if you haven't got GMC, just basically the last year's worth of rotations. What were you working? What start date and date? Was it a training post or not? What specialty was it in? What level was it in? And so on. And whether or not you've had any time out of training and for what reasons. OK, so some of you won't be asked to fill this in now. Most of you will, but you will also have to fill this in every year before you have your ARCP, okay? So just go through that and fill in the relevant bits. But 
form R is the one that often causes difficulty. People aren't often sure which one of these things to pick. That's why I wanted to go through it, okay? As I mentioned, in Scotland, the equivalent of form R is called Turas. The equivalent of, of form R, part A, the equivalent of part B is called SOAR, S-O-A-R, okay? So next thing I wanna cover is an overview of the structure of training and MRCGP. And then we'll talk about the course and then we'll take questions. So you may have four month or six month rotations for the hospital part and also for the GP part in year one and year two. Whereas in year three, all of you will be a full year in GP, all right? Some of you, for example, might do a hospital job for six months, then do GP for six months in ST1, then go back to hospital for six months in ST2, then go back to GP. Some of you will do all of your hospital at the beginning, then your GP. Some of you will do GP for a year, then hospital in the middle, then back to GP. It's different everywhere. Some of you will have four month rotations. Some of you will have six month rotations. All of you in the third year, the full year will be in GP, okay? Most deaneries, you will now have 12 months of your training in hospital and two years of it in GP. But there are still some deaneries where you will have 18 months in hospital and 18 months in GP. There are some deaneries and some rotations, mostly a few of the Scotland rotations, where the training is actually four years, okay? Some of you will have those innovative schemes. As I mentioned, they can be called dedicated skills or ITP posts, where you spend some of the time in GP, some of the time in hospital. I did this and it's fantastic. So all of this is deanery specific. So all you need to do is wait till they send you the details, look at the rotations that you get allocated after you've picked, and then you'll have a clear plan of what's happened, okay? So then I wanna to talk to you about MRCGP. So MRCGP, membership of the Royal College of General Practitioners, is the compulsory exit exam for GP specialty training. I, if you want to finish GP training successfully and get a CCT, a Certificate of Completion of Training, you must complete MRCGP, all three parts. So the three parts are workplace-based assessment. So this is assessments that happen throughout all three years. You'll start getting assessed from about the second week of starting GP training in year one, all the way up to year three, workplace-based assessment lasts. AKT is the Applied Knowledge Test. So this is the theory test. 200 questions in three hours and 10 minutes. 80% of it is clinical medicine relevant to GP. 10% is evidence-based practice, research methods, statistics, graphs and charts. 10% is organizational and admin topics, medical, legal, practice management, types of contract, things like that. Different types of forms that we need to fill in as GPs. You can only sit this in ST2, i.e. your second year of training or later. You cannot sit any part of the examined parts of MRCGP in ST1. You will do workplace-based assessment throughout the whole of training. And then, in the third year, you will sit the SCA, the Simulated Consultation Assessment. This is a brand new exam. It hasn't even launched yet. It's going to launch in November of this year. But by the time you guys get to ST3, because you cannot sit this exam in ST1 or ST2, this will have been well established. So the final format hasn't even been published yet. What we know so far from what's been published is that it will be a remote exam. So you'll do it from your GP practice that you're at in ST3 and you will be consulting remotely with 12 different simulated patients. And for each one, you'll have 12 minutes to take a history, come up with a diagnosis, come up with a management plan and explain the whole thing and finish, okay? So 12, 12 minute cases, you'll have three minutes of reading in between each case to read the notes of the next patient, but they're all simulated patients. And the whole thing will be marked live by RCGP examiners who are also not in the room with you, they're remote, they're watching the whole thing. Some of them will be video consultations, you'll see the patient and hear them. Some of them will just be audio. You'll just hear the patient like a telephone consult because we do both of these in real life in GP, okay? So that's an overview of MRCGP. You must pass all three of these in order to get MRCGP and in order to complete training. In terms of workplace-based assessment, essentially you'll have an e-portfolio and you'll have ongoing assessments throughout the whole of training. There's lots of different assessment tools. There's 10 different types of learning logs and there's certain checkpoints. So you'll do all these different types of assessments throughout all three years, okay? You'll have various assessments, including these are the newer types of assessments that were recently um, introduced. So leadership activities, quality improvement projects, prescribing assessments, care assessment tools. So some of these you'll do early on. So this you normally do in the first or second year. These ones you're gonna do in the third year of training. And then all of these, they'll be happening throughout all three years of training, okay? So that brings me on to the GPSD plus course on how to maximize your training. What this course will give you is a real clear understanding of all of the requirements of what to expect, the checkpoints to get through year one, year two, year three, um, an understanding of how to prepare for the different parts, 
the navigation of the e-portfolio, how to write a good clinical case review, how to get the most out of the e-portfolio, the 10 different types of learning, how to write a PDP for each rotation, uh, the new assessment tools, the checkpoints you need to reach in ST1 to be allowed to progress to ST2, the checkpoints you need at ST2 to be allowed to go to ST3, how to get through ARCP, what to do if you get an adverse ARCP outcome so that you can improve by the next one, because if you don't improve, you might be released from training, i.e. asked to leave training. For AKT, we'll go through sample questions. We'll look at why do people fail, how to prepare, when to sit it. For the SCA, by that time, because this course is going to run in June, they will have published the final format. So we'll practice some sample cases. We'll look at why people have failed the precursor of this. So this is developed from the old MRCGP CSA and RCA, which have been running RCA since the pandemic. But CSA was like this, but used to do it in London with simulators live, okay? That was running for over a decade. And we've been helping people prepare for that now for a long time, okay? Um, but we'll also talk about which courses, certificates, diplomas might you try to do during training to help you become more competitive and get the most once you complete training. So things like DCH, DFSRH, DRCOG, minor surgical course, the STIF course, the drug misuse certificate. We'll look at in detail the GP registrar contract because it's very different when you're in GP then hospital junior doctor contracts, which a lot of you will be familiar with. So we'll look at the salary scales, um, annual leave entitlement, study leave, how to make the most of your study leave, the working week, and what to do if you're not getting the right amount of teaching compared to clinical input. We'll look at medical legal issues. So what are the reasons people get complaints against them? And what are the things you can do to try to reduce or avoid them? What are the reasons that might lead to people being asked to leave training and how can you avoid those things? We'll look at portfolio GP careers. So I'm a portfolio GP. You know, what kinds of things could you add into a portfolio career? What are the options? What is a GP with specialist interest? How do you develop a specialist interest? You do that after you've finished GP training. But there are some things that you could do during training that will get you a head start. And then how to succeed in GP training, key tips. Now, for anyone that wants to start training with a head start, have a clear plan, hit the ground running, know exactly what to expect so that you can now just focus on the training because you're not worried about all of this. You've got a familiarity with it already. This is really going to help you. For anyone that hasn't got much NHS experience, I would say that really this is going to hugely increase your chance of not getting into trouble, of at least having a clear idea of all the requirements and things that are going to help you get the most out of your training. Okay, But for anyone that just wants to hit the ground running, this is going to really help you. So there's details here. Now, we have a limited number of £100 bursaries available. So the date for the course is 10th June 2023. It's a full day course, 9.30 to 5.30. It will run via Zoom as a global live stream, and you'll get access to the recording for a month afterwards if you book the live session. If you can't book, you will be able to just subscribe to the recording at any point afterwards, okay? Um, and at the moment, if I show you the website, if I take you to that page, we've got an early bird discount, okay? So if you book by the 10th of May, i.e. a month before the actual course, there's a 55 pound discount. The standard course price for this is 250 pounds. It's a long full day, right? But if you book before then, you don't need to put any codes in, automatically it gives you a 55 pound discount up until this deadline runs out, okay? Up until the 10th of May. But on top of that, if you, used eMedica to get into GP training. I used our online service or came to our Crama course, used any of our resources. We have a limited number of bursaries worth a hundred pounds each. I, you apply that to this, then you get another hundred pound discount. So you'd only pay 95 pounds. So if you click here, the hundred pound bursary, it'll take you to the page where you fill in the details. Tell us, you know, your rank, your score, the feedback on, the e-medical resources, please use the same email that you used when you booked the e-medical course or online so we can cross-reference to make sure that you're eligible. And then the first 100, basically, you'll get a code which you can use to get a discount. That's actually out of date now. There's another five have been gone since I updated this slide a couple of hours ago. So there's actually 70 bursaries left. The first 30 have already been used. Once the bursaries are gone, you'll still be able to book, but you won't get the discount. You'll still get the early bird discount though, if you book by 10th May. If you've not used eMedica before, you can still get that 55 pound discount by just clicking here and then booking before the 10th of May. After the 10th of May, it will cost 250, okay? So the rest of the time for this session, we've got 10 more minutes, is for Q&A.
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look through the Q&A. Um, so if anybody's got any questions, please ask. But for anyone that hasn't got any questions, I do hope to see a lot of you at the GPST Plus course on the 10th of June. And um, I hope that this is not the end, but the start of our helping you and our supporting you and our journey together. You know, one of the things that we're really proud of is that we've, as I said, in our 18th year now, and there's many people that came to this course decade plus ago then came to us for AKT to CSA, RCA, now SCA. Uh, we have a course for people who are about to finish, okay? Um, and they're now program directors, they're examiners. They're, some of them are, pro, you know, like uh, associate deans um, in, in different deaneries all over, every single deanery all over the UK. And I hope that similarly, I've kept in touch with some of these doctors. It's one of the things that makes me really happy is seeing them doing wonderful things in their career, okay? Um, so for anyone that hasn't got questions, I hope you found this helpful. I hope to see you at the GPSD Plus course. All of us at eMedical wish you every success in your training. Congratulations once again on all your hard work and getting an offer. Thank you so much. Have a great evening.